How's everybody? How's everybody? You have to understand that after you follow Dr. Sadwa, there's a certain amount of energy that is built inside of you that has to be released, and, and, and it's a great I honor. Made, I myself, Fernandez. <laughs> I know you did. <laughs> I'm an interventional radiologist, and it's a pleasure for me to um, speak about imaging as well as intervention. Um, for any medical historians other than radiologists, I don't know if anybody knows who Anna Ludwig was, um, but this is the first documented radiograph. She was the wife of uh, Wilhelm Conrad Röntgen, and that was the first radiograph with the iconic uh, image of the ring um, of, on, the, on the third finger. That was in 1885. This is an x-ray of the hand now. Now, this is a multi-detector, multi-planar, contrast-enhanced CT of the hand with reformations to bring in the bones. And for the people up close, you may be able to see some of the vascular tufts at the finger tips. Now, I submit to you that they're both x-rays, but they're very, very different what we can provide now as what was provided before. So I submit that we should be providing this kind of images for the Annas that live in 2020. Pel pelvic venous chronic uh, uh, syndrome is defined as uh, chronic pelvic pain attributed to gonadal vein reflux and venous engorgement and typically caused by either incompetent vein valves or structural abnormalities. Now, we've heard that not all patients with gonadal vein dilatation um, have PVCS or PVI. Thus, there's a need for clinical correlation and for focused non-invasive diagnostic imaging confirmation. This is a schematic of many of the images that Peter has demonstrated, where the pelvic anatomy is extremely complicated. Parietal tributaries, visceral tributaries, there's association with the cava, with the renal veins. In the pelvis itself, the communications are extensive. And also notice how communications go down to the legs for the great saphenous veins. And these are where we see breakthrough escape veins that we see with some of our leg patients. The workup includes ultrasound, MRI, and CT, and I'll go through those, and then I'll highlight using cases where we can provide some good care. So ultrasound has broad availability. It is inexpensive. There's no radiation has dynamic real-time imaging, so we can study our patients in an upright position in endovaginal ultrasound, as well as provocative maneuvers such as Valsalva. The drawback is that anatomic and patient factors may obscure optimal visualization. MRI has imaging sequences optimized both for pelvic anatomy and the uterus and ovaries can be exquisitely demonstrated as well as assessing dynamic vascular evaluation. Protocols are used to evaluate the gonadal vein reflux and pelvic venous connections. This is a long name for a sequence, but the important thing is that it's MR angiography, and we're all acquainted with angiography, seeing an enhanced vessel through time. And also, we can use other sequences where we can detect direction of flow. The databases uh, allow for robust 2D and 3D post-processing techniques. And even their blood pool contrast agents that show excent venous and arterial visual visualization during a steady state phase to get a whole perspective of the anatomy. Multi-detector contrast-enhanced CT is used when structural abnormality is suspected. It is exquisite uh, spatial contrast and temporal resolution. And the isotrophic CT databases allow for robust post-processing capabilities, multiplanar reformation, curved, 
planar reformations gives images in 2D, as well as volume rendering gives 3D overall perspective. Incidental venous abnormalities have to be clinically correlated. And the one thing, though, is it does not provide information on flow. For the most part, MRI, including time-resolved MRI, is the preferred non-invasive method. Instead of giving you criteria and findings on these tables as for um, pelvic venous insufficiency and other causes of pelvic veins, I'm going to highlight these by demonstrating some cases. This is a 37-year-old woman with chronic left pelvic pain. This is a transvaginal ultrasound. And my pointer is not working there. It's OK. But you can see the colored, dilated um, pelvic veins in the left parametrium space. The asterisk demonstrates the uterus. And also on the grayscale, you can see the large hypochoic vessel. And on duplex imaging, the, on the left-hand side, the dark area hypochoic, that represents the left renal vein. And the red portion, the red vein, if you look at the color scale, demonstrates that flow is away from the renal vein, indicating that there is venous insufficiency or reflux. This woman has pelvic pain and pressure in the pelvis. This is a, a CTV where there is both arterial anatomy and venous anatomy demonstrated. If you focus on the left gonadal vein, you can see that there's a 360-degree loop that I would challenge anybody to go in there blindly and try to do that in an efficient time. As well, if you look at the right gonadal vein, you can see that there are multiple branches. And if one is going to be embolizing that, then one has to take into account those branches. We approach this from a jugular vein access through a sheath a glide wire going down, and knowing that hair loop turn, I did not advance it further for fear if I didn't have this, um, the CTA, I would wonder when my guide wire was going back up towards the neck, I would have wondered if I was extravascular, difficult to know. With a guide wire and catheter manipulation, I negotiated that hairpin turn, stabilized the catheter, and then was able to confidently start embolizing using coils. I'll just let this run through a little bit just to show that once the coil is being released, the catheter remains stable. And this is the final image showing stasis of the flow with the coils. Again, I would think that in this case, that imaging was tremendously helpful in doing this case in a timely fashion with great results. MRI findings in a 45-year-old woman. This is dynamic time-resolved MR, temporally obtained. So these images, this one, the next one shows a little bit more enhancement in the left gonadal vein, and then further enhancement to the point that you see pelvic veins and the curved arrow in the image on the right demonstrates the arcuate veins crossing over to the right pelvis. This is, again, the reformatted images. This is a coronal view that shows the large gonadal uh, pelvic veins. And this is a axial uh, T2-weighted images to show fluid. And it shows both the veins, the bladders anteriorly located. This is better demonstrated on this dynamic time-resolved MR angiography cine loop where with the injection of contrast, you're actually seeing the flow of the contrast through it. And you can tell direction. You can tell how quickly it goes. And this is very, very impressive as far as confirming your diagnosis. Let me move on to May Thurner syndrome. This is the classic description of the right common iliac vein compressing the left common iliac, the, the right common iliac artery compressing the left common iliac vein against the L3 or L4 vertebral body. This is a coronal CT 
demonstrating the anatomy of the aorta and the cava. And on the axial views, you can see the red arrow demonstrates the tiny um, vein being compressed. This is a 45-year-old man who presented um, with acute left lower extremity pain, swelling, skin discoloration following a long-distance flight. This is the axial CT demonstrating the iliac artery compressing the iliac vein. And on the coronal view, you can see that the left iliac vein is acutely thrombosed, once again giving indication if one's going to do thrombolytics of the extent of the clot and what you need to do. Now, this is a CT 3D uh, rendering images. On the left is the artery and vein. With the software, one can erase out the aorta and the iliac veins, and you're left with the vein only, and you can see the indentation. And this by no means, I want to say that IVIS um, or CT is better than IVIS. IVIS is the best as far as guiding. However, with that dimpling, none of us could determine the degree of compression. But once again, if we do multiplanar reformation, on the image on the right, you could see the elliptical compressed vein, which is what one would see on IVIS. Also, post-treatment, this is um, from Elliot uh, Fishman at, at his Hopkins lab. You can see that the stent has been placed into the stenosis. And also, on the axial images, you would be able to see the flow inside the stent. Now, nutcracker syndrome. Um, is regarding the space between the superior mesenteric artery and the aorta. And for sake of uh, time, I'm just going to progress here. This is the compressed um, renal vein. And this is the refluxing left gonadal vein. This is similar. Some pitfalls um, to keep in mind. This is uh, an 18-year-old woman. And you can see that there are uh, hemiacigus and acigus. And this is a case of IVC atresia. 80-year-old woman, pelvic veins. She's got a clotted IVC. And in this 38-year-old uh, woman, you're seeing some collaterals in the uh, pelvis, early filling of the IVC. And this indicates a pelvic arterial venous malformation. So to conclude my recommendations, uh, in residency, I was always told you don't see it if you don't look for it. So I would suggest to you that one looks more with imaging. Secondly, I would persuade your radiology department to provide state-of-the-art imaging. It is our responsibility as clinicians to have the best tests. And I would also suggest to Peter to move to Connecticut where we have better radiologists. <laughs> and lastly, uh, find an IR uh, person who is committed to your standard of excellence. You know, nowadays, in the days of PACs, we no longer speak, clinicians don't speak to radiologists. And that's a tremendous loss. So find somebody who's as passionate as you. And if you know some of us radiologists, like Dr. Fenn, Dr. Dillon, uh, Dr. Harris, and myself, you can catch us on good days. For myself, just don't pick a day where we have a, a journal club. That's an inside joke. But uh, because we really are user-friendly and can help you out. Thank you. <laughs>